Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Coach Kill Funday back at it once again, kicking it for you and for yours. And we're going to talk about um, Queens of Pan Africanism. And this queen right here is not really well known or discussed. So I'm, I'm going to spend some time on talking about this queen. This queen is named Laura Adorcore Coffee. You no, know, and she's with the UNIA and she has a, um she came straight from Africa. She's a Ghanaian princess that came straight from over from Africa to the helped out the UNIA. And that story is not really discussed or really talked about that much in historical preference. So we're gonna give her some some straightening right now. Uh this comes from um this thesis I'm reading um, reading about about the um international you know the women of the UNIA, you know what I'm saying? They don't give much credit. But you know, she don't get credit now. You feel me? So without further ado, we're gonna get down to this. On March 8th, 1928, Princess Laura Adora Coffee was assassinated while speaking at a UNI meeting in Miami. She received reclaim within the organization for her ability to revive struggling UNIA divisions in the Southeast and attract new membership. Between 1926 and 1928, she held camp style meetings at baseball fields, public parks, church sanctuaries, and Masonic lodges, such that overflow forced many listeners to stand outside the edifice and line adjacent streets. Her message was in due in the rhetoric of black nationals in the 1920s. The tenets of the UNIA program and her experience as an African prophetess. What she called for was simple. African Americans need to make credible preparations to return to the interior of Africa. Unlike Marcus Garvey, Coffey did not advocate reparations to Liberia, but encouraged immigration to less developed areas of the continent. The Ghanaian Princess Coffey brought to the UNIA an African female perspective on reparation. Now, for those who don't know, it was two things that we really wanted. One is today's hot topic of reparations. Reparations meaning in the land here and whatnot, and staying here. And the second thing was reparations. You know what I'm saying? Reparation, which was God sent us back to Africa and sent us back to where we come from. Okay, let's get back to it. She presented a Native woman's voice in response to UNIA missionary schemes, outlined the objective co-authored by Amy Ashwood. As a campaigner for the UNIA programs, she echoes the concern of other UNIA women for the return to stricter moral codes of conduct within the organization. She also led extended discussions for the need for African American men to work in cooperation with the women to steer the course of racial progress. Now we're gonna focus on Kofi's two year tenure in the UNIA, a role in rebuilding the organization while challenging Marcus Garvey and his advisors over misappropriated funds further illustrated the dilemma faced by women and their late leadership. Laura Coffey remained an undone allegiance to the UNIA core program, even as she was declared personal non grata in late 1927. Certainly, her church, the African Universal Church and Commercial League, ACL, ACU, was largely based on the UNIA doctrine. The church is still active today. Illustrates how Coffee transcended UNIA and Marcus Garner to become a despotic figure, a despotic figure. Her adherence to her members of the UNIA program and the creation of a, of a direct link and exchange of the continent are just two examples of her impact on both organization and the Atlantic community. Her influence had an intangible practical effort on Africa and its descendants of that of Marcus Garvey, Mosea Garvey himself. Evidence compiled from Princess Garvey's. Oh, excuse me, Princess Kofi, limited appearance in the Negro world, her sermons, her testimony, and her arrangements in Tampa and Jacksonville, Florida, along with her religious talk and a testimony that I witnessed of a trial of her alleged assassin, revealed the nature of her influence in Alabama, Louisiana, and Florida, specifically, and on the UNIA more broadly. The World Coffee public battle with the man in Garvey's inner circle and the violent solution that result speaks of the desperate struggle for power within the UNIA in 1928. Although she previously demonstrated women in the organization often assume overt leadership roles when they found a UNIA man wavering in their pursuit of racial progress. 
Coffee rise to fame within the organization was considered a direct threat to authority. Coffee, like Ashwood, Jacques, Davies, and Demina, never publicly challenged any man in the organization, but only warned Garvey about the company he kept. While her intentions may have been altruistic, her ability to draw a following threatened both the authority of the ministerial alliances that supported the UNIA and its tenuous relationship with the UNIA form of white authority and the power of the UNIA male's leaders, notably in Florida. This highlights another way that you are loyal, which women loyal to the UNIA program, but at our tech, Garvey himself operated. While the official recognition of early membership ceased in 1927, she remained significant to the UNIA grand narrative. Her place in the organization's historical geography, despite her brief time as a member, is further submitted by the organization claims that all people in the sport, whether do paying members or not, belong to the UNIA. Colors and bloodline made you a member of the organization. Paying dues merely got you on an organization role. The sport membership is often based in culture consciousness that set up a polar opposite of here and there. Here being invoked as a rhetoric of self affirmation and reclamation of a place alleged to be stolen from, alleged to be stolen or hidden from the rightful owners. Bridging the gap between here and there, Laurel Crawford assembled Atlantic Creoles, resembled the Atlantic Creoles, and that she spoke of pigeon English and attempt to engage in commercial business ties between the continent and the West. Her presence in the UIA contributed to the dysphoric identities and a social, cultural, and political manifestation. While encouraging a rethinking of the West, she promoted a cultural, a continual reinvention of Africa and the sport through cultural work, migrations, transformations in communications, as well as globalization of capital. Within the organization and the sport at large. The mysterious warrior of Mother Africa. Lua comes from migration to the United States from Accra, Ghana. West Africa is shrouded in mystery. Her early life recounts the difficulties of women of African descent often encounter when attempted in the United States. All these trek to the United States occurred in phases. In her introduction to her audience, or her to her audience started to spur from her native Africa to Canada. Along the way, she went to the Panama Canal Zone in 1925 as a feature guest speaker at the UNIA meeting in Cologne, Panama. Her experience in Cologne by her notoriety that followed her to Detroit UNI circles in 1926. Between 1926 and August 1927, she visited Marcus Garvey in Atlanta Penitentiary. Princess Coffee established branches of the Universal African Orthodox Church in New Orleans, Alabama, and Florida, while soliciting members for the UNIA and helped revitalize fledgling branches and divisions. In this way, her work in the UNIA is similar to that Jacques Garvey. Davis and Demina. Coffee was heralded as a prophet of Garveyism, while the Miami Division, 286, viewed her as the female John the Baptist. For historiographical considerations of Coffee by historian Barbara Blair and the biblical work sketchwork of her in the Black Church by historian Richard Newman, focused primarily on her as a religious charismatic speaker. In these accounts, Coffee contributes to, to Black nationalism ideas and her role as a prominent figure in the Black Atlantic are highlighted. Our contributions in UNIA, however, takes a, on a new significance within the content of her speeches, the response of her lay membership, UNIA officials and observer are combined with her legacy, her role in America, the Caribbean, and Africa. That legacy is based on large part of her church and the ability to interpret UNIA objective. It is also based on the success, albeit limited, in actualizing a repressing scheme. According to UNIA objectives, the organization sought to assist in civilizing the backward tribes of Africa, to strengthen the imperialism of the Botswana land, Liberia, etc., and to promote a conscious Christian worship among native tribes of Africa. Coffee proposed that the organization reevaluate the necessary of sending preachers and missionaries to Africa and assert that Africa was not backwards in its religions or government beliefs. She argued that Africa was a kind of elaborate and sophisticated array of spiritual beliefs and practices, Christian or otherwise. Evidence of a Christianized Africa 
was first signaled by Henrietta Peters at New York UNIA meeting 1919. Ms. Peters and her husband were missionary to African Methodist Eswatonian Zionist Church to the Gold Coast of Africa from 1915 to 1925. In her view, the people of the interior of Africa were governed under the most refined judicial system of law, order, and authority. In contrast sharply with the time-honored tradition in America that the Negro was a natural and rapid rapine. Mrs. Peter's reports was followed by another AME missionary, Emily Christmas Crinch. She advised in 1920 that Africa was never more in a receptive move for the UNIA than today. And the time was right for going back to Africa and possessing the land. She invoked the here and there polar opposites as she told the listeners. You might think it's a wonderful thing to be in Harlem, but you had never enjoyed your manhood until you walked in Liberia and come in contact with a black president of that country and received invitation to come to the banquet that's prepared at the State House. You surely cannot go to Washington to see one. And so, after all, I would rather be in Liberia tonight. All things being equal, without trolley cars, without subways, without her elevated system, to feel and to know that I am a woman of all that. Black skins or short hair, money or no money, you are a man and have an opportunity of the greatest of being the greatest person in the Republic. The only requirement in Love Liberia is that you're black. Prince's stringent link between the recombination of black manhood while setting foot on African soil. Travel to Africa was in the potential for a transformation, not only of status, but also of keeping in mind, also of the mind. In keeping with the efficient women tradition of the UNIA, which encouraged men to take their rightful place in a pursuit of great progress, her words were geared towards the men. Still, as she closed and she noted, the only requirement in Liberia is that you're black. And it came out women and children also presented with new possibilities. This is Ms. Peters. And Mrs. Crinch claimed they were derived from a mandate from God. Lord Coffee also claimed to be doing his work. Princess Coffee presented herself to the UNIA crowds, doing the work of her old man, God, and of her father, King Kippersling, and the elders of the African community who decided to endorse a mission to America and supply her with documents, credential, and a power of attorney to represent them, along with samples of their product and raw materials. And above, she has given a message by them to their people in America. Members of her family, who held the little office until the mid-1980s, continued to defend the legitimacy of her immediate ancestry. They also sanctioned the authority given to her by her countrymen to speak on behalf, on their behalf in the United States. So she was the African, the Ghanaian African representative to UNIA, Laura Coffin, which is not talked about. And this is, like I said, all documented legitimate, and her family members held the offices in Liberia until the 1980s. Around that time, the Civil War popped off. Okay, and got and got until 1980. Excuse me. Our parents to come home to build a prosperous and to start important export business with Accra to get them started. In this way, Golf become a pioneer entrepreneur and a unique advocate of African American women, political, social, and economic activism. Although the UNIA claimed it was a colonial negotiation with the President's CDB, King of Liberia, and sent three delegations over a six-year period in hoping to achieve a written colonization agreement, King and other Liberian government claimed that this is not true. During this time in which a credible agreement was supposedly reached, Liberia entered a land contract with Firestone Rubber Company and publicly denounced the UNIA. Aside from publicly disassociating itself from the UNIA, the Liberian government instituted measures that banned UNIA members from setting foot in the country by refusing them visas and invoking, revoking privileges previously to send anyone associated with the organization. Coffee, Laura Coffee presented a different strategy for reparation. Her plans included avoiding any reliance of already established African countries, presenting greater opportunities for individuals as well as collective wealth. Mother Coffee, as she became known, advised that those of you who go into Africa, not going to towns that already built up, go into the interior and build your own town, children. Prepare and build up the old waste places. Children go away out among your people and put up your own stores. 
because the other fellow is going to have it and isn't going to have to give it away to you. Her strategy for reparation was reminiscent of the American pioneer experiences where families moved to the West in search of land ownership business and business opportunities. Many African Americans during the antebellum period also looked to the West where slavery and Jim Crow had been unsuccessful. By establishing towns like Athens, Ohio, for example, they provided themselves a pornography, a base for the creation of new communities, businesses, churches, and schools. They also created space for the rule by the sons and daughters of ex-slaves. These territories, they shared space with the Native Americans and whites who shared similar demise, desires. Although Liberia, just like the American West, presented new possibilities for former slaves and their children, it was not only the reparation alternative. Coffee warnings about seeking one on grounds may have resulted from an example set by the founding of the state of Maryland State in Africa by the American State Colonization Society in 1854. Maryland State was located along the coast between Grand Sess and San Pedro Rivers, which provided access to trade with the African interior and Atlantic world. In an effort to control the ports and maintain control over the monies generated by these ports, Maryland repatriates declined to join with Liberia. Instead, they opted for their own independent nation state. Coffee's awareness of Maryland's example may have come through one of the churches she worked with in Kasimi, Ghana. Kasimi was a cultural center in the capital city of the Ashanti region and served as a crossroads for the region. Unfortunately, Maryland was unable to maintain complete sovereignty. Due to military encroachment by its neighboring people, Maryland became a county of Liberia, a county of Liberia in, 19, in 1857 after Liberia assisted the nation state in rebuffing its enemies. County status allowed Maryland to maintain internal autonomy while giving access to its military prowess of Liberia. Had not only the crew and the Cuban people forced the need to increase the organized army on Maryland, one can infer that they would have maintained their own separate nation status. Their limited success serves as an example of a kind of reparation scheme Coffee advocated, which differed from the one Marcus Garvey had in place when she first entered UNIA circles. Both approaches built a long standing effort by African Americans to establish a home in Africa as early as 1780s with the presence of Paul Coffee in Sierra Leone. The views the UNIA reflected are those expressed by Martin Delaney, Alexander Cromwell, Henry Winnell Turner and Edward William Blyton who approached Africa with Europeans as the bearers of civilization and the universal and normative values that the Africans should emulate. In doing so, these men came to view Africa with cultural ignorance and a sense of superiority, just like Europeans. And they objectified Africans as primitive and who lacked the capacity for self-enhancement. Kofi took issue with this viewpoint arguing that Africans not only had their own culture, forms of government, and standards, by, but by these institutions were no need to repair. Her accounts supported the recollections of Henrietta Peters and Emily Crinch. An interpretation of Africa and African reparation from the viewpoint that these women appeared to have a difficult slant in a man credit with the champion idea. Not only was coffee reformulating African colonizational efforts, but she was one of the few recorded African women inviting African Americans to return to the homeland. While African Americans in various colonization society in America and England raised funds and devised plans of return of slaves and their descendants to Africa, there were few recorded formal invitations to former slaves and free people of color to return to Africa. Lawrence Coffee's assertion was that she was sent from Africa to ask African Americans if they wanted to come home to let us know, and if you don't want to come home, let us know. Serve as a formal invitation by a native-born African to their geographically distant, to their geographically distant cousins. In this capacity, she serves as Acura's diplomat. Coffee's self-possessed role as a diplomat was similar to that to Lady Davis. While Garvey noted that it would be extremely improper to send a lady delegate to the UN, as ladies were never chosen as members of the diplomatic mission. From the start of her tenure with the organization, 
they were received and it was received in international circles as the delegate of the UNIA. Whether Lord Coffey was aware of this is not clear. In some ways, Coffey's assumption of a liaison status between Africa and UNIA at times, when other formal channels have failed, may have been brought under her student. What is clear that she presented her message and invitation in terms readily understood by the people of the diaspora. In part, it was part of her presentation and a central focus of the redemption of Africa as the means for the diaspora to reclaim itself and struck a quote with the UNIA members and non-members alike. The official womanhood of UNIA was further highlighted by Coffee's ability to create fictive and literal links with Africa and historic Africans, despite their her disagreement with UNIA officials. Her message resonated with the leadership to such a degree that she's perceived to be a threat and attempts were made to discredit her in both the UNIA, New Girl World, and Murray Stream Press. Despite the Nigger World Declaration that she was fake, her message drew massive crowds. She continues speaking, receiving speaking engagements. Her contributions to her church flow interrupted, uninterrupted, and people throughout Florida and Alabama are letting this demonstrate her support by buying passage on her ships she attempted to purchase from Japan for a voyage to the Gold Coast. So, as it states right here, Mother Coffee was attempting to buy ships from Japan go to the Gold Coast. Now, many people don't know, this is a side ride on this real quick, that during this time, the Japanese is doing a lot with black people. You know what I'm saying? And there's many organizations that displays this. You know, I got a couple of videos on it on my page that discuss how the Japanese are trying to, you know, do their thing with black underground black organizations. Another, it's time for discuss at another time. While Garvey and other UNIA officials, particularly UNIA lawyer and Garvey confidant J.A. Cragen, sent to register branches throughout the state, banning coffee from means and expelling her supporters, people continued to gravitate to her, towards her. Garvey's response to coffee was guided in part of a visit from the Miami Day, Pres Miami Day Division President Paul Green to the Atlanta Penitentiary in September 1927. Along with ministers in the UNIA, Green disagreed with the lay membership assessment of coffee as marvelous, and as responsible for the fact that Garveyism was spreading like a wildfire, as she had and told the good news and was still doing. Layman membership or Dr. Rachel Coffee appeared in the pages of the Negro World and circulated throughout the UNIA circle for several months. However, the sentiment of good feeling was to be short-lived. Lawrence Coffee, Vision of Africa. Coffee's popularity presented several problems for the UNIA and African American ministers alike. She was aggressively signing up members for the UNIA. Her campaign set up a delicate balance between local preachers and UNIA officials as her Sunday afternoon meetings and all week rallies left churches empty and collection plates empty. Her popularity had bungeed into this as she held several meetings in baseball fields and without benefits of public notice. People were lying in the streets long before the opening hour to hear her. Many of her speaking engagements became standing room only events. Moreover, some of her speeches being directly criticized both local UNIA ministers and UNIA officials caused a great stir. Her management against do nothing preachers and men who used the UNIA for their own personal self interest did not go unnoticed. Our Amy Division President, Claude Green, made an appearance before Garvey one month later to answer his coffee charges and discredit her claims. As Garvey said in prison, the idea that someone in outside the inner sanctum was drawing souls that rivaled a number of participants in the UNIA parades and convention meetings events opposed a threat to his leadership. During her camp style meetings, coffee encouraged the audience to enroll your names with your mother and children. If you do not have but one drop of black blood in you, and you know you cannot pass for white, enroll your name with mother. The immediate response to her call indicated the extent of her popularity. In the month of April 1927, Coffee single-handedly registered 1,000 members for the new members for the UNIA. As her popularity arose, rather than earning accolades, she was earning new enemies. Although the UNIA praised Coffee for her efforts, 
is shun her for them. Still, coffee like Ashwood and Davis continue to maintain an unwavering allegiance to the organization ideals and sought ways to have them programs to become a reality. Coffee was another example of the uniqueness of the UNIA women in their approach to racial uplift. Her life illustrated an ideology and a practice of racial uplift that blended the nationalist trends of the 1920s and the ideas expressed in the women's movement of the same period. Black nationalism during this time has been defined as the belief that black powerlessness could be overcome by setting up mechanisms of self-determination. It had also been defined by Wilson Jeremiah Moses as more than a mere dissatisfaction with the condition of the United States. The dissatisfaction felt by many African Americans during the 1920s translated an impulse toward self-determination among the Africans transplanted to the New World by the slave trade. Their goals were defined as racial goals, whereas race was essential to the environment in which they lived. These goals were well packaged by the UNIA. It was also internalized and reinterpreted by the UNIA women. As noted through this discussion, one such program expressed the UNI objective to establish universities, colleges, and secondary schools for the further education and the culture of our boys and girls led to the formation of Liberty University. The pursuit of education as a form of liberation, much like reparation progress, was long held throughout the diaspora as a means to overcome imperialism and racism. Just as Coffee advocated a literal approach to reparation, that include building new towns in Africa, establishing trade with existing native run entities. She also, she was also a sound supporter in an ethnic-based education that would enlighten her listeners to the reality of the Africa, as well as imagining, as well as managed by native people. She encouraged all people in the sport to equip themselves to build a stronger nation in Africa and cooperate with their native brothers and sisters. This differs slightly from the UNIA approach to education which is sought to train boys and girls for the services on the continent of Africa. UNIA popularity in Virginia was due in a large part of pre-existing programs that attempted to, rem to remedy the evils of Jim Crow to varying degrees. The founding of Liberty University, religiously the purchasing of Smallwood Quarry School, was heralded as one of Garvey's early achievements in establishing formal school training. Garvey's original intention was and it's a Tuskegee-like institution in Jamaica that would, in time, furnish competent men and women as technical missionaries to be sent to the mother country, Africa. It was also used to support, to promote a figurative and, and literal link with Africa as a school site to be on the spot where the Negro slaves landed in 1920 and 1622. And near the disembarking point of first cargo of the American slaves in 19... In 1619. By buying this land, the UNIA attempted to reconnect themselves with the past and the history lost during the Middle Passage. The president and the vice president of Smallwood Quarry School and the members of the UNIA, Kyle Robinson and Dr. St. Clair Drake, attended, because of the history of the place and the sacredness to our group, we are deciding to make it a southern headquarters for the Garveys at the African movement. And there, a great school to teach and train boys and girls, men and women of African descent. The training offer was to enable students to live in Africa and be an asset and not a liability. To highlight the importance of the asset status, the Negro world described the school to the readers as a development of a distinct school for Negro people in which they may learn something about themselves and their race and about Africa, their motherland, which they could not learn in other race schools nor in a white schools open to them. To be taught that the Negro has had many rights as any other racial groups and that he needs a country and a flag of his own in order to make his rights effective is something new in Negro education. While Gary, while you and our air officials stressed the importance of fostering a generational ready to serve and work in Africa, after the African coffee portrayed was not needed of the missionaries, in order to suffer from lack of educated people and able people. Coffee depicted Africa as a kind of land peoples with the infrastructure that was ready and wanted to receive those willing to come. She proclaimed that it is the natives who, in many countries of Africa, own and control their homelands. And since they own and control their homelands, it is the Africans themselves who carry on the industry and commerce of their own countries and selling their raw materials to markets of the world 
in turn buying all kinds of manufactured goods. Coffee depiction of Africa spoke of cities operated and managed by African people. Many of these cities had every modern convenience of black mayors, city authorities, houses of legislators, or natural rulers, kings, and leaders. Instead of sending missionaries to Africa or preachers, Warren Coffee asked her listeners to work with the natives. She asserted a need for skilled laborers and encouraged her in the skills to help Africa further develop. According to Coffee, what it took to make life available in Americas was no different than what it takes to develop the interior of Africa. The skills, the skills set home by sharecroppers, today laborers, factory workers, educators, journalists, and entrepreneurs were all deemed essential in coffee's reparation schemes. The membership accepted her word as a direct message from Africa. According to Ms. Adele Jennings of Jacksonville, Florida, listeners were taken in their plain folk approach and heard her words as potential to play an active role in African redemption. Through her, they could do more than simply buy stocks in fledgling enterprises or stage figurative battles of reclamation through parades and land purchases. She depicted Africa that was very real, reachable, and desirable for their return. As Garvey and the UNIA stage parades through the streets of Harlem, Poland claiming those streets as African-American political territory, the World Coffee encouraged her listeners to take a trip to Africa and establish themselves there. After doing so, she claimed they would make the trip back over here. And y'all would smell something like you would say to me, smell something stink. The stench in the air of the Americans for coffee was a lot of racism, low self-concept, gender bias, and ignorance that kept people of the diaspora disconnected from the continent and their potential. While coffee establishes churches in the United States, she only did so in the hopes of that those churches would serve as links to West Africa. In looking at her travels in East City, where she established a church, there was a connection to major boards and other modes of transportation. This is not an accident. In keeping with the goals of her diplomatic mission, coffee appeared to seek ports of call where trades and transport of goods can occur. Her Florida Converse claimed that her choice of Jacksonville as her home in America was due in a large part of the city's proximity to Africa. Kofi's intention was to ship and receive goods between the two continents, thus creating the 20th century triangle trade run for and by Africans and their despotic cousins. Kofi desired to establish a trade business for her to the ports of Jacksonville. She was also guided and mentioned earlier by her belief that Jacksonville was the closest place, figuratively and literally, to Africa. At that time of her notoriety, Jacksonville was played by lynching and acts of terror, which led her to suggest that Negroes learn to help yourself, create your own jobs, build your own enterprise, clean up your lives, love one another, patronize one another. If you don't learn how to help yourself and build industry and commerce with your motherland, Africa, you are doomed and done for. Keeping Africa in the forefront of the minds of the followers was essential to the UNIA program. The greatness of Africa was often spoken of in many UNI officials, including the provisional president general, Marcus Garvey, held a fictitious leadership position and a link back to the continent. Africa was not presented to the UNIA lay leadership as a series of independent countries, but instead as one large occupied state. All these assertions of mayors, legislators, and councils in Africa served to the present a more nuanced and incredible view, albeit exaggerated at points. Her credibility in making these claims of a civilized Africa was bolstered by her appearance. Unlike Garvey, Harvey never crafted a vision for a regal African costume dress and periodically in European style uniforms and plum hats. Instead, she described her followers as beautiful brown skinned women of medium height in the early 30s with a head of full of lovely hair, not straightened, who wore at all times only plain Western style dresses. And except for the harming of an African made gold brooch, there was no jewelry seen on her. Her choice of dress also served to endear to her listeners. She looked like them. The efficient womanhood of UNIA became more detailed through Kofi style of dress and her mannerisms. 
which included a light pitched step in a presence that seemed to command respect and intense admiration. The efficient women like coffee were approachable, celebrated people for who they were, and saw a place in the fight for racial progress for everyone, regardless of educational background or economic status. I witnessed the council rule rally describe her message as being one of good news and glad tidings from Africa. In these speeches, she ran in three key points. She began by offering greetings and reminded the audience that she had been alone, she had been away from home for a long time. Second, she asked, why are you not ready for preparations to come home? Her last point was to ensure listeners that in the Gold Coast, Ghana, there's a door open for all Africans. And you and your hearty welcome is waiting for your forty. She asked that they have been a purchase of machinery and tools to send to Africa instead of sponsoring trips of preachers who know nothing else but to preach. The Dimes, women, and men are already performing UNIA-based projects, such as the Negro Factory Corporations and Millery, the community-based vegetable garden sponsored by the, U, by the Black Cross's nurses, and the UNIA-run restaurants made them access to Africa. The free labor labor, women gave to these organizations as secretaries, lay organizations, organizers, cooks, nurses, veterinarians, and businesswomen provide the skills and ability, provide the skills and ability that will carry them far and build into Africa. The efficient womanhood of the UNIA became just that a means of finding a way of new avenues of doing to help advance the race. Through the blending strategies and expansion and refashioning of the ideas that are prevalent in the period, Coffee and other UNIA women lived in a distinct form of activism. As a result, a record of what can be described as more than feminist, more than black radical, less than elitist, and equal to the contribution of the male contemporary remains. The uniqueness of Coffee in particular, and the hand of the lay membership and in general, remains included in discourse centered on the intersection of race gender, and class. Historians Club of Women often argue that women kept to themselves emotionally and often physically distant from the form of the masses. They find them to be less in touch with the masses, and they also sought to assist and more in tune with the personal quest to prove themselves to society at large. Within this group, however, there were men and women who spoke specifically to the type of other they sought to bring for their race regardless of social status or economic background. Such persons existed in UNIA, and Laura Coffey was one of them. As a native of Africa, Coffey believed that the poor Blacks need to know more about their heritage and their lives of living persons, of persons living in Africa. She proposed an intimate import export relationship between the UNIA and her father's kingdom in Accra. At this time of her death, it was believed that the King King Kindness of Accra would come to the United States to have her murder investigated. This never occurred, however. Her connection with Accra and King Count Kissing has generated some debate during her lifetime and among historians since. While the UNIA began as a rumor of her forged ancestry to discredit her, it also urged the government officials to deport her in December of 1927. And read that again. While UNIA began rumors to forge, to began rumors to forge ancestry to discredit her, it also urged the government officials to deport her in December 1927. Mm. In the recent years, the contention over her identity as an African appears to have been settled by Richard Newman, where the correspondence with her family and church fathers has sustained the legitimacy of her claims. Relatives of Kofi were still in government position as late as 1973 and provided letters from Kofi Church where she served as a medium, a coming to a process of prophetess in this country. And from the government registry, attesting to her birth and lineage of Laura Adora Kofi of Ghana, of Accra, Ghana, West Africa. The rift between Kofi and the UNIA and the Ministerial Alliance occurred for seven reasons. First, she was presenting herself as a lay preacher directed by God at a time when women in the pulpit were not really accepted. Although the UNIA had canonized the Virgin Mary and depicted her as an ideal black woman, at the behest of female delegates Hannah Nichols and Carrie Minus at the 1924 UNIA convention, UNIA convention, 
the organization prepared, I'm prepared for women who openly defy organization conventions. Puffy spoke out against fundraising events that included dancing and liquor. She also objected to the African Legion and the African Motor Corps running drills on Sunday. Many UNIA branches met in held weekend meetings and practice and drill practice after lunch, after church, excuse me. For Princess Coffee, however, this is sacrilege as it constitutes the work of the Lord Day. Coffee expressed these practices was not unique and reflected on not only in the sentiments of women in the organization, but was also the theme of many African American women and men, preachers of light during the late 19th century, early 20th century. The involvement of 250 preachers, missionaries, men and women in the UNIA has been documented by Randall Birkin and Guardian of the Religious Movement and Black Redemption. Church men speak for the Garvey movement. There is no document evidence of any preacher taking similar stands in the presence of dancing and alcohol at the UNIA fundraisers. Some of the female missionaries, including Emily Kirchhenshaw, expressed a disdain for the atmosphere of some of the UNIA fundraisers. However, many male preachers did take the exception to a coffee of bloody to sway members and became a learner of her rapid rise to prominence. As the people move, so did their tidies and offerings. While the UNIA posed a financial threat, ministers aligned themselves with the organization in part to bridge the gap in their collection plates. To all shoot losses, many assessed rental fees for the use of church halls. Coffee's rise to prominence, while solely based on her work as a UNIA organizer, presented no abilities for, her, for gaining additional revenues for local ministers. The people would follow her, whether she's in the organization or not, and find that she could take monies away from the UNIA pot. By 1926, Garvey faced deportation. Amy Jacquez Garvey, along with Henrietta Vinton Davis, became the de facto head of the UNIA. Their leadership was heavily contested. Lord Coffey took center stage during this period of turmoil in the organization. The timings of Coffey dissent provided a contest for a fierce opposition to counter. Every child identified many inadequacies of the male officers, most of whom resigned from office at the start of the BSL crisis. Current, concurrent with Gary's imprisonment was a heated discussion in the, the African-American community and society at large over the appropriateness of women preaching for the pulpit. In 1924, the Episcopalian Church voted down by 191 to 49, a resident that called for women of the hood of the church, we represent the church councils equally as the manhood of the church. The phrasing of the re-institution or resolution remembered what the UNIA women asked for and received in the 1922 convention. The UNIA women, already synthesized the discussion for the women's place, began to assert themselves again in 1924 as they watched women in the United States and Britain seek leadership in churches. They noticed that the men had begun to let the copyright on Christianity run out and sought to reestablish their reverence in their communities. African Americans of the period came under internal and external criticism for falling prey for the many vices of the 1920s. UNIA women found that the preachers were not doing enough to protect their families from the evils like alcohol, gambling, fornication, and sought ways to become more vocal. This atmosphere, when coupled with the columns in the Negro world entitled the Ascendancies of Leadership, authored by Lady Davis, know that the women were ready and prepared to act the man continued to procrastinate. In response to these rumblings, some of the male hierarchy regarded the sentiments Davis expressed. Amy Jacquez Garvey issued apologies of sorts. Jacquez apologized for wanting equal opportunity to fulfill any position in the organization and regretted that this offended any old fashioned tyrannical feelings of those who spoke of a better day coming, while they did nothing to usher that day. Not only did Coffee speak of a brighter day, she initiated that that day was the dawn as Africa awaited the return of her children. Loretta Coffee, personal non grata. Aside from the discontent, their discontent with their limitations they faced within the organization and those the church played or placed upon them, Coffee and other women expressed dissatisfaction with the role of the Christian nation and the abuses of the third world countries and the failure of the church to engage in a program of progress. They referenced the money that flowed on churches on Sunday while the jobless and penniless saw little or none of it. The church needs to do more. 
and then you and I Abe presented itself as doing so. Oral Coffee agreed more needs to be done, but did not live long enough to realize her ambition. The challenges, however, must, was taken up by her followers, who not only formally incorporated her church, but, swift, but established a Swahili dictionary to teach the language to members and sent four missionaries to Africa to set up schools and establish ties with governments in hope of carrying out her import export endeavors. Unlike the UNIA, Coffee's African Universal Church implemented practical stratagems, albeit for limited success to redeem the diaspora. The second reason for Princess Coffee's personal non grata status in the UNIA was that her popularity threatened to dilute the hero worship they sustained fiery power. Followers of Coffee were hers alone, but members are not, but were her not, followers of Coffee were not hers alone, but members of the UNIA. Her first and foremost call was to the listeners was to return to Africa and redeem themselves in their motherland. The redemption of Africa was not solely grounded in what the diaspora could literally do for the continent, but in what the people of the diaspora could do for themselves. She claimed, my God, call me out of Africa. Come over here and I'll tell you what he will have you do. Although she claimed to be reluctant to answer the call because she was a woman, she wanted to explain that God only intended to, intended to use me until he find a man. Not only did her statements imply her divine connection, but also suggest that no man alive at the time was capable of the task. This was the most damaging as Garvey had a few, very few male allies left in the United States and infighting among the vision leaders and headquarters played out publicly in the African-American press. Still, Coffee never publicly denounced Garvey nor specifically named any UNIA man or minister who attempted to defame her. Like Ashwood, Jacquez, and Davis, Coffee enjoyed a degree of notoriety between throughout the UNIA world. However, the most favorable response of her presence came from the Southeast. The limited exposures to Garvey faced and primarily rested on her inability to establish a direct connection to Garvey himself. Laura Coffee was an outsider. Although she was honored with banquets and made with four efforts to capture the hearts of the people, for an expansion of UNIA ranks in Florida and Alabama and a rebirth of branches in New Orleans and Georgia, she was never part of Garvey's inner circle, as were Davis and Garvey's wives. Still, her willingness to follow the UNIA program spoke to her, one, her willingness to overlook Garvey's flaws and the difference to the goals she established. Her allegiance to Garvey was further demonstrated when she gathered 1,500 signatures to send on him on behalf of the Jackson Brill branch to the with the President Calvin Coolidge petitioning for Garvey's release. Opie said that collected the signatures easily. Not only were people gathering here, but they were doing what she asked, she asked. Despite her disagreeing upon some UNIA policies, like the fundraising techniques, Coffee's participation in UNIA efficient womanhood led her to champion Garvey freedom just the same. The third reason for Garvey Coffee being ostracized, ostracized stemmed from her relationship with whites in law enforcement. Laura Coffee was twice arrested in the state of Florida after prompting for ministers and UNIA officials in each community. Her first arrest in St. Petersburg, her second was in Jacksonville. In both incidents, she was bailed out by her followers in a matter of hours. In each instance, she was charged with disturbing the peace. J. A. Cragen, Marcus Garvey attorney, was in Jacksonville at the time of coffee, September 22, 1927 arrest. From eyewitness accounts and articles published in the Negro World, Cragen May Girl was a discredited lure of coffee. In a te telegram sent to Cragen at the Richmond Hotel in Jacksonville on October 10, 1927, Marcus Garvey, then incarcerated in the Atlantic Penitentiary, Garvey instructed Craven to insert the notice into the local white daily that Laurel Coffee has no connection with the Universal Negro Employment Association and the association shall not hold yourself responsible for any sums of money she may collect from the public or membership of the organization for any scheme in Africa. Charter of that division that's entertaining her is revoked. Notify them the same. Garvey's request was preceded by a telegram on September 20th, 1927, just two days before Coffee was arrested in the late hours of the night while sleeping, which reads, 
I've given Mrs. Kofi no authority to collect funds from a member of any kinds of African exodus. I know nothing of her proposition for sawmills and ships. I will not be held responsible for the activities in that damage. If the people have been defrauded, they have legal recourse. I offer no one to give authority to collect funds for such a purpose. If the people are so dense as not to be able to protect themselves, I can do no more. I know nothing of the affair. When taking the connection with Garvey telegrams in the presence of Craigan in Jacksonville and the result of her trial, Coffee or rest suggests there is some of my cooperation with the UNIA. Although complete court records are not available, excerpts from the trial indicate that while in police custody, the princess was stripped naked and searched to determine if she had any roots on her body or any markings that she indicates she practiced black magic. Hmm. According to the reports, no evidence of her being anything but a human woman was found. Judge Madison addressed Ms. Coffee as the African woman causing all the trouble in Jacksonville, but he dismissed her case and let her free to carry on her program. Judge Mathis, Madison's description of Coffee as an African woman indicated her, that he viewed her as a part of a separate cadre from other blacks in Jacksonville. His dismissal of the case, which included allegations of, allegations of fraud and misappropriation of funds, lends some degree of credibility to Coffee efforts on behalf of African Americans in Florida and the UNIA at large. During Coffee's trial, J.A. Cragen appeared in court every day with an unidentified white man. President research had not yielded any official records identifying who he was. Eyewitness accounts state that Cragen was accompanied by a court by an unidentified white man, a bodyguard, and a female secretary. While researchers agreed that Cragen was in Jacksonville to investigate Coffee, no official UNIA record or Negro world specified who was with his entourage or why he would need one. Initially, it appeared that the white community supported the UNIA's desire to get coffee quiet. However, the support was temporary as the case against her was dismissed and she was free to continue preaching throughout Florida. She was unable to enjoy this freedom long. On March 8, 1928, the UNIA's African Legion of the Miami branch visit Laura Coffey as she spoke at the Liberty Hall location on Northwest 15th Street in Coconut Grove, Miami. It was part of their, it was part of their routine to heckle Princess Coffey at their public appearance. The night before, Coffey supporter and a UNI African Legion got to a tussle. In the response, the police pad led to Coconut Grove Liberty Hall and prohibited its use by either group. Rather than cancel the meeting, Coffey Falls decided to move to another location, Fox Thompson's Hall, as where they were not was as they were not in an official UNIA building. Coffey and her audience felt the African Legion would leave them alone. What she neither what neither she nor any else suspected, however, was that a single shot would ring out, piercing her in the head, and silence her almost instantly. The shot fired was from the back of Thompson Hall at a distance at 50 feet. In any case, the person with some skill could have been the executioner. Many of the men in the African Legion possessed military training necessary to fire the gun. Historian Barbara Blair notes that many of the members of the African Legion were World War II one veterans. The man alleged to have killed Coffee was Maxwell Cook, a Jamaican who serves as the captain of the Miami Division Legion, James Nemo, a Bohemian and colonel of the Legion and Carl Green, president of the Miami branch. President research indicate none of these men have military records. Whether they are actual murderers remains in dispute. Maxwell Cook was beaten to death by Coffee's father shortly after the princess fell dead. Nilmo escaped a similar fate as she called being handcuffed to the steering wheel of a police car. Neither he nor any of the eyewitnesses indicated how he managed to get to the police car or why he was handcuffed. Along with Nemo, 13 others, all men, was arrested by the Miami-Dade police with the 12th being released. Only Green was held in connection with the murder. On June 28, 1928, he was in indicted on the charge of first-degree murder, and James Nemo was indicted on accessory before the fact for aiding and abetting Green. Eyewitness accounts claim that Nemo received a signal from Caldwell Cook, Maxwell Cook, 
to take the shot. Disputing these accounts, Caldwell Green provided documentation that he was under medical care for his diabetes, was actually at home that evening per his doctor recommendation. Neil Moore presented a witness to testify that he'd been at the meeting, was actually on his way out when the shots fired, leaving with 70 other men on the so leaving with 70 other men on the Legion. No. The jury returned a not guilty verdict for both defendants on July 10, 1928. Judge John D. Johnson ordered both men to remain in custody of Robert Stokes, a UNIA member on good terms with the white community. Hmm. No subsequent investigations to the death of Maxwell Cook or any follow-up investigations to the death of Laura Coffey has ever been conducted. To date, both deaths remain unsolved. After a cooling off period, James Green immigrated into Canada and James Nemo could return to his native Bahamas. Despite voluntary departure from both men of Florida, the subsequent United States created room for further discussion on who assassinated Laura Coffey and why. Money for the defense of the alleged assailants were raised through donations from UNIA membership. This is not the first time was solicited for the defense of accused murderers within the organization. Similar tactics was employed for the defense of James Eaton killers after his fall from grace in the UNIA. Although his killers were found guilty, their sentences were dramatically reduced and both of the saints free from jail. While Coffey presented a challenge to Marcus Garvey leadership, she did not do so in a UNIA program. In fact, she based most of her, lawyer, most of her church philosophy and practices on a UNIA program, and even use one God, one aim, one destiny, the UNIA model as a church's model. Her attempts to warn Gary of the less than honest men in her inner circle during her penitentiary visit was not well received. Instead, she was viewed as a threat. Her popularity and the ability to mobilize her audience among the grassroots, her direct link to Africa beyond Liberia, and her unwillingness to compromise her conviction despite pressures from the UNIA and the Ministerial Alliance, made her a perceived threat. Like Davis, Coffey served in a relationship with Garvey, but not with the UNIA. She continued to promote its goals. In fact, on, one, on the night of her murder, she was speaking not on behalf of the church she was attempting to establish, but on behalf of the UNIA. Her tenure in the UNIA gained her much fanfare at the time of her death. However, it was not only the reason that her grave marker was discovered as it was left unattended. Not only has she been neglected by the history books, but she has been more by the community which she helped establish. Coffee represents a perfect example of the challenges of many UNIA women face in attempting to remain members of the organization. Not to make her life is but one answer to appeal by Jacquez Barber, by Jacquez biographer, Will Taylor. To have his friends presented the conditions of the organization which challenged our understanding of Marcus Garvey and Garveyism and unveiled the complete other reality of, black, of a black radical. Laura Coffee Life and Lessons. According to Barbara Blair, the violent martyrdom of Laura Coffey can serve as a metaphor in examining gender politics and the ideas of power and authority that's in dual Garvey movement. Laura Adora Coffey life, her mysterious entry in the United States and her violent death present many challenges for the story of race, gender, and a moral freedom struggle in the Atlantic world. Coffey established her authority whenever she spoke publicly. She began introducing herself and stating, I am a representative of the Gold Coast of West Africa, seeking the welfare of African peoples everywhere. She set out to see Africa redeemed by my children of Africa. Part of redemption called for African Americans to sit together and pool their money towards a collective event which occurs as monies raised from her viewing were used to build a church and establish home for members. Two years later, the training school she originally established in her front parlor was relocated to a building of its own. It was brought in part with investment returns from the funeral proceedings and money monies donated by church members. Coffee admonished her audience not to believe in false reports that Africans were backwards or that Blacks lacked the capacity, capability to establish their own governments. While encouraging listeners to serve God and love your motherland, Africa, she encouraged them to aspire and to become dedicated men and women 
who are skilled workers such as engineers, carpenters, bricklayers, mechanics, icemen, and women trained to be qualified in the profession and those who are already making the capacity to build on the motherland. Here, Coffee did something interesting. She named the blue collar professions and as a result gave them status by knowing they had counterparts in Africa. She recognized skilled trades as important as those of them, but by listing these everyday jobs, she signified their importance in the building of Africa and ultimately the Black nation. As demonstrated through this work, you and I, a brand of empowerment, was not to be the exclusive right of the educated elites or paid for by the expense of the common Black man. Coffee's life was one illustration that the type of empowerment that UNIA sought would not come in the expense of one economic group or another. The nation Coffee spoke of, indeed, every profession, therefore giving every person, male, female, lawyer, bricklayer, and significance. Coffee grounded her authority in the belief that she was divinely chosen, not only because of her royal African blood, because she would best be led by God. Although she was, Temporary, received temporary in the Garvey's inner circle. She never received any loyal titles he gave members to UNI Hark. It is ironic that she did not need one as a direct lineage to provide her one. Office's idea of Back to Africa was both literal, literal and figurative. She didn't have a connection between Africa and her listeners. In her view, the strides that African Americans made towards their own economic self sufficiency was essentially linked with the sovereignty of their African brothers and sisters. Coffee not only sought to build in Africa for Africans, Americans, but also establish a base where Africans can come to America. Her work as a UNIA loyalist, a prophetess, and an entrepreneur, a teacher, and an activist in the American South suggests her centrality as a despotic figure. Coffee's life challenged historical representations of the Atlantic world. The Atlantic world framework from here forward had been largely limited to the 1700s, 1890, early 19th century. Coffee came from Accra to the United States via England like most travelers of the Atlantic slave trade. She apparently traveled back to Africa from the United States in early 1926. She spoke of symmetry between the people she met in Florida and those she left behind in Accra. After her death, her hands of her belief and inspiration continued to work. In 1944, ACU, sponsored community, was established in Jacksonville, Florida. Their aim, its aim was to create a law-abiding Christian community, two, a memorial to Laurel Coffee, three, opportunity to educate the group's children, four, a means of cooperation with the political state, and five, a way to live in African-American existence. The community became known as Adadorkoville, established a school throughout the African, and taught African history, language, geography, and culture. The congregation and the other adherents were encouraged to speak Salu Zulu. Mm. And the books with basic senses and translated Bible passages freely were distributed. In Alabama, church members learned to pray in Bantu and were taught Zasa group songs. While promoting preparation for a recreation in Africa for the African American community, the church also sought to solidify a connection with Africa. In 1931, the AUC sent six men to Africa hoping to start schools and negotiate trade agreements. These efforts were short-lived as the church finances could not maintain the efforts. The establishment of the church and attempt to foster credibility attempts at fulfilling UNIA goals that serve as one of the measures of coffee impact. Coffee, Laura Coffee life and legacy is tended far beyond the UIA. Her presence adds to Florida Atlantic World Connections and also serve as evidence of a far reaching experiences of the UNIA. Her work also speaks of strange adherence of many UNIA women and meddling in both gender and national politics. I'd be at a price no other woman in UNIA asked to pay. And there we go, you know, um, she, she did big things in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, set up many, um, you know, down in Miami, set up many, um, when I ate things, and she's not really well known because she got into it with Garvey, and she was not really in Garvey in a circle, telling that Garvey need to watch the dudes, so and she got around him, you know. And you know, as I said, they kind of discredit her, you know, but her lineage still stands this day that she was an African princess that came over and spoke for Africans in West Africa, saying, "Come back home." 
this before Kwame Chroma, you know what I'm saying? And, and people like that, you know what I'm saying? So kind of Africans to come on home and come on back, you know? So this is an important figure in African history that I already talked about, you know, Princess um, Laura Coffin of Accra, Ghana. And um, we should really look more deep into her works. It's a shame they assassinated her like that, but I've been reading through history and stuff like that and the UNIA ordered a couple of assassination hits, you know? They talk about another guy in um, New Orleans that got killed, but they ordered a couple of assassination hits to where um, around this time when things were breaking up that maybe we don't know about. And also um, dealing with the white authorities. You know, another thing we not talked about with the UNIA because they're trying to um, fantasize it a lot. But every group has their faults and their worries and things of that nature. And I was just one of them, you know. She was a well, like I said, as it's spoken in here, she's a well named organizer, so she organized a lot. And you organize, you crown them all the time. Because those are the ones that bring the money to the group. Those are the ones out there ducking, they're not the leadership per se, but they out there representing and going gun ho for the group. You know what I'm saying? Something we need to look into and something we need to take, you know, take a fact into while we're dealing with this. You know, dealing with the history of one night. And as you say, you know, she built up stuff, have, you know, built up churches, the church is still going on strong. Had a speaking in Zulu, you know, and I'm not sure, you know, a South African language, you know, which is, which is damn good. Had him praying at Bantu, you know. So it was building up. She was doing her thing and making that connection, you know, that Pan African connection, the community known as Orkadoville. I might have said that wrong, Anadorkaville in Florida. So she was doing big things, you know. A lot of stuff we gotta give her credit for that she's not getting credit for during the history books. Anyway, subscribe to the channel. Much love. Hope y'all liked what's popping off on the history tip. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and we're gonna keep on dropping this history.